In 2003, tell about the time you're stopped by customs agents at an airport in Switzerland. Yeah, we had flown, uh, I believe we had flown from Spain, Lance and I. Um, and he had a little duffel bag full of a bunch of syringes and things like that, some EPO. I do know that because he was Lance Armstrong, a lot of rules really didn't apply to him. For example, once I remember flying back into Spain with him, and uh, of course we always flew on a private jet, and so we fly into the little airport in, in Girona, Spain, where we lived. Um, and it was my wife at the time, and my daughter, and his two kids, and his wife. And so we walked up to where the customs guy was at the window, and he didn't stop, he just kept on walking. And the guy, the guy said, hey, I need your passport. And he said, no, no, we don't do that. And then the guy noticed who he was, and he said, okay, you guys can go. He just kept walking. And that's how it was for Lance. I mean, he, I remember him getting really, really angry one time because he actually got a ticket in Austin. He was proud of the fact that he would get pulled over all the time for breaking the law and never get a ticket. And he was absolutely furious that someone had the nerve to give him a ticket. So the fact that he flew with drugs in a bag, I think to him didn't seem like it was going to be an issue. Uh, the customs guys were looking through it and it was clear on their faces they thought something was out of the ordinary. And they started asking questions, but he didn't speak Swiss German or Swiss French, whatever they speak, and I can't remember what language it was. Um, so we had one of the team uh, employees, his name was um, Yogi, his name was George, he went by Yogi. Uh, he's Swiss, they had him come in, he was supposed to pick us up at the car and he explained to them that it was a bunch of vitamins and that they should quit asking questions and eventually they decided it wasn't worth the hassle and they just let us go. But like I say, uh, some of the things that, that, he, that he did and the stories that I have, they might sound ludicrous that he would take risks like that, but the rules as much as he didn't believe they applied to him, really most of the time didn't apply to him. During the 2003 cycling season also, why did he want to have you stay at his apartment in Spain? Well, during the three years that I was on the team, we, during the Tour de France only, uh, I shouldn't say only, I also did the, the Vuelta a España, which is a three-week stage race, just like the Tour de France, but it's a Spanish version. Uh, for those races, we would do blood doping, so we would remove some blood and save it in, in a refrigerator. We had a special medical refrigerator that had the, had a little um, readout on it, like a, just the temperature, and so they would keep the temperature at around two degrees or three degrees Celsius. And um, he wanted to go train in San Moritz, and it just happened that that's the year that I was coming back from my hip, um, my hip surgery and my fractured hip. And so I wasn't riding quite as well, and they didn't want me to go do the, the difficult training camp uh, at that time in San Moritz. And so since I was gonna be in Girona, where he lived anyway, um, he asked that I stay in his apartment just to make sure that nothing happened with the refrigerator. He said just check the temperature a couple times a week and make sure that the electricity doesn't go off because even though they're packed, the blood bags were packed with uh, like ice packs so the temperature would remain more constant if the electricity did shut off. It's still a risk and, and if something happens, I mean it's unlikely but since someone was there why not have someone watching it. So if something happens and the electricity goes back on, you would never have a way of knowing that the blood was not stored properly until you use it, in which case you would probably get sick. I mean, you wouldn't die, but it wouldn't be good. And you certainly wouldn't want to do it in the middle of a race. So he just said, feel free to stay at my apartment, just make sure that nothing really goes wrong. And so um, it was nice. I mean, his apartment was $3 million and mine was 1000 bucks a month, so I was happy. And on the bus in 2004, uh, it was on a remote Alpine road that the team bus stopped. Explain the situation and what happened. You know, a lot of these stories that I have in my head, I hadn't ever really told them because even though the people around me that needed to know, I made sure they knew I was doing things, I didn't go into detail about it because a lot of the times it didn't, it seemed so removed from reality. I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't deluding myself into thinking that no one, that, that everybody knew that these things were going on behind the scenes. It still felt strange to me that we would be going to such extremes to do what we were doing. And, and this every, is during the 2004 Tour de France. Yeah, right. Well, so to get back to that, during that race, um, well, during each progressive tour that I had done with Lance, um, the staff and the doctors and, and the team themselves, became more and more paranoid that something was gonna happen, the police were gonna find out or somebody was watching. Um, because in any given year in cycling, some, something happens in Europe. I mean, 
it may not be reported here, but the police would show up at a race in Italy or something like that and raid the hotels. And so they became more and more concerned that some somebody was going to find some evidence of this because it does leave physical evidence. I mean, there's equipment that you need to do it. Um, and so this year, uh, that particular year, the, the just plain, I don't, I don't even know what to call it. They, they became really, it was paranoia. Um, Johan Brunil and Lance had asked uh, their one assistant, his name was, he went by Duffy. He had gotten all this equipment and he was convinced that, <laughs> I don't know what equi where he got this stuff, maybe on the internet it was this weird looking detectors or I don't know, alien looking stuff that you carry around. <laughs> like he was looking for bugs in the rooms, he thought for sure that somebody was gonna, I don't know, plant a bug in the room or the police were watching us or something. And so that year, the first time we did it, the, they um, they had us go into a room where they had he had put plastic on the floor everywhere and on the walls. This is a team hotel. Yeah, <laughs> he had taped off every every uh, like every hole and any kind of vent or the smoke detector. He had taken down and put tape over it and the windows and everything. And you weren't allowed to talk when you went in the room. It was it really was weird. And I, certainly, what the only thing I could think when I was in there was, if somebody is going to come in here and see if we're doing something, they're going to know something's happening in this room because this is not normal. <laughs> There's stuff everywhere. I mean, it was clear that there was that whatever was going on in that room needed an explanation. Well, anyway, that was, that went fine, and then they decided they didn't that that wasn't even extreme enough. So they decided the second time we would do it um, later in the race, they would just do it in the bus and have Duffy meet us halfway through the transfer after the stage. Um, on, and they would take a detour and then pretend the bus had broken down. And the thing about the tour is, it probably sounds like it was conspicuous from the outside what we were doing, but there's so much chaos going on. So anyway, we picked a remote road where there really wasn't very much traffic. And we sat there for um, an hour. I mean, it doesn't take very long to do a blood transfusion. It, you, can, you can do it in 15 minutes on a particular guy. And when there's nine guys and two or three doctors doing it, you can, the whole thing can be done in an hour. So we sat there for a while, and the mechanic, I mean, the bus driver pretended to be working on the motor in the back. And if you took somebody that had never seen any of this and wasn't sort of eased into it, I guess it would have thought this was the most absurd thing you'd ever seen. But what by was this, this time, it's, what was the scene in the bus? So there'd be some regular benches in the front, and then you'll have some long benches on each side in the back. And so there was a couple guys on each side laying down on the benches, and then the blood, they'd just tape the blood bag up higher than them and allow gravity to let it run down. Lance was in the back, um, I remember, by the bathroom, and he was laying on the floor and, but I mean, guys laying on the floor and, in the, and on the benches wasn't that out of the ordinary anyway because you're exhausted after a tour stage, so that's just the way it would normally look. You just wouldn't have a bunch of blood bags taped up. <laughs> I mean, I say this all matter-of-factly, and I know how stupid it sounds, but the fact is it just, by that time, it's just the way it was. and. As it was happening, we just accepted it. But yeah, in hindsight, and when I would think about it afterwards, it did seem pretty ridiculous. If you don't mind, to explain the benefits of blood doping. Well, for cycling and for for sports in general, there's really um, only a few ways to in, to enhance your performance using using drugs or performance-enhancing substances, whatever we call them. And, and I guess you could put um, a blood transfusion in that same category. Um, there's a drug you can use to add red blood cells to increase, stimulate red blood cell production, and that's called EPO. And, and that drug has been detectable for some time uh, in large amounts. I mean, you can use relatively small amounts and still get a good effect, but it takes a long time. And so in a race like the Tour de France, where uh, typically uh, red blood cell volume, for whatever reason, comes down throughout the race because of stress and other things. Um, it's helpful to add blood during the race. So what we would do is we would remove a couple units of blood, half a liter each, um, over time while leading up to the race. And at the same time, take some EPO to try to stimulate blood production um, quicker so that you get back to a level where you can train hard and recover from it. Um, and then during the race itself, you would uh, re-inject the blood after, after probably a week, and then again a second time after another week. The result is uh, an increased ability to um, deliver oxygen to your muscles from your lungs. It's uh, 
greatly exaggerated effect of training at altitude. I mean, it's been known for some time that training at high altitude is helpful, even for sea level events. Um, and the result of that is just more blood. And so what we would do is we would exaggerate that by just artificially manipulating it. And it's not very complicated. Um, all you have to do is store it in um, somewhere between zero and two degrees Celsius so it doesn't freeze and, and not keep it for too long because the blood cells do age in the bag uh, over time, but it's really quite simple. You said that Lance would talk to you about blood transfusions on training rides. What would you guys discuss with regards to performance enhancing drugs? I had questions and so I would talk to Lance about them on our rides in San Moritz. Um, and he was as knowledgeable as anybody, but the thing about cycling that probably doesn't come across is that, uh, come across to the public, is that drugs and, and the medical side of cycling is not one or two guys here and there, here doing it over here and two guys doing it over there and winning races and, and no one else knows what's going on. It's ubiquitous. It's everyone knows what's going on and everyone talks about it. Um, and so to me, it seems surprising that it was Lance Armstrong, but it just happened to be that way. That was the guy I was around as I was learning about it. Ultimately, five years later, I realized over time that that's just the way it is and people talk about it. It's not, it's not some sort of secret within the Peloton. How time consuming and expensive was it? It's, it's expensive if you do it, if you want to do it right and not take any big risks. I mean, like even small things like where Lance asked me to stay at his apartment, you need people to help you. You can't always physically be doing everything and you need sources for things. And if you want to take huge risks, you can go buy stuff on the internet. You can buy drugs on the internet. First of all, you don't know what you're getting. And second of all, there's a, there's a easily traceable trail of money and, and products, right? So if you want to pay more, you can take less risks. And so for 50 to $80,000 a year, you can probably take very little risks and get it done. And then what avenue did you like to go? I spent quite a bit of money. I spent about uh, 80,000 bucks, I think. A year? In 2005 and six, yeah. Okay. How much assistance did you have? Not a lot. I mean, I had uh, a couple people that would just physically deliver things or, or watch it for me, but I didn't have any, any doctors that were giving me advice on how to do it. By that time, I more or less knew. And it, the tests don't change that quickly, that, that you'd be caught off guard by something. I just, I just needed to have people, and I, I paid them well because you don't want to stiff the guy that knows things about you like that. All right. Tell me about how you had blood delivered during the 05 tour to France. In, in 05, I... Uh, like autograph seeker or something? Oh, no, that was in, in 2006. 2006, yeah. okay. This, I did two blood transfusions in 2006. The second one I did, I was paranoid about having weird people walking into the hotel in and out. I mean. I just didn't want somebody that, if someone was watching, they could see if someone that hadn't been around had showed up. So I had the guy come with a, just with a jersey asking for an autograph. And when you finish a tour stage, there's, you know, 50,000 people there and they, they all have access to you. And uh, it's hard to pick out anything out of the ordinary there. It's just chaos. So I, I said, I told him to wait at the finish on the right side. And I went and he found me and he came with a jersey and he had a little uh, bag of blood, but it was wrapped in a, in, in like a, just like it was a gift. And it's not very big. I mean, the jersey pockets in the back, you can fit, you can fit a half liter blood bag in there. It's about the maximum amount you can put in there, but it doesn't, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to be riding around with something in your pocket at that point. Um, so he came up and, and I asked for an autograph and then offered me a gift and I put it in my pocket and just rode back to the hotel with it. So we just did it right in front of everybody so it wouldn't look out of the ordinary. I mean, if you knew what it was, it would be out of the ordinary, but there's a lot going on at the finish of a tour stage. No one could possibly pick out any, anything strange there.